Peace and blessings be upon you all. My name is Abdul Qadir, and I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our event, which we have called Tackling Islamophobia. And do we need to rethink it? Bef oh, hang on. <laughs> so, for our discussion tonight, um, I'll be calling upon two of our speakers, Dr. Samir Malik and Dr. Chris Allen. Dr. Samir Malik is an ENT surgeon in Nottingham and a researcher at the Centre of Stem Cell Biology here at the University of Sheffield. He's an editor of Islamicate.co.uk, which is a website that encourages intellectual debate and dialogue among the British Muslim community. Dr. Chris Allen is a senior lecturer in social policy at the University of Birmingham, and he worked extensively in researching Islamophobia. He has written a book entitled Islamophobia and is very attractive on social media and regularly writes for the Huffington Post. So I'd like to present to you Dr. Malik and Dr. Allen. So just like a round of applause. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to our first Islamic Conversations event. The purpose of these events will be to encourage debate and dialogue on a range of issues affecting Muslims in Britain. And what we hope to do is to bring you leading thinkers within their disciplines to add to this discussion. And I'd like to start off by thanking the University of Sheffield for providing us with the facilities for hosting this event, and also to the University of Sheffield Islamic Circle for the tireless effort in arranging the logistics for this very important discussion that we're going to have today. So on to today's discussion, we're going to be talking about Islamophobia and how to tackle it in a meaningful fashion. Now it's well established that hate crimes against Muslims are on the rise, and indeed I'm almost certain that there are probably, probably members within this audience who have suffered Islamophobic attacks in some way, shape or form, be they verbal or physical. But before we discuss how to tackle Islamophobia, we must clearly understand how it differs from academic criticism of the faith. And of course this brings in a wider discussion about freedom of speech and how to use freedom of speech in a responsible fashion. Only then can we go on to discuss how to tackle Islamophobia in a meaningful fashion. And as Abdul Qadir mentioned, Dr. Chris Allen has worked extensi extensively in researching Islamophobia, and up until recently was part of the cross-parliamentary working group on tackling anti-Muslim hate crime. And hopefully we can probe some of these issues in greater detail. Welcome to Sheffield, Chris. Thanks so much. Uh, Chris, I just want to start off um, uh, by asking you first question, really. I know you've probably been sick of, you've been sick of, kind of answering this particular question. Um, but just for the sake of the audience over here, I was wondering if you could just briefly go over what Islamophobia actually is and how that differs from legitimately questioning the tenets of Islamic theology. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, th I, th I think this question continues to, to kind of be asked because the fact that there's so many people that keep saying that Islamophobia doesn't exist. And one of the ways that I see it is that by keep questioning what does this mean, what does this mean, what does this mean, in, in a way, it kind of under, tries to undermine the, the, mm. the fact that it's a reality. So, it's it's a very it's a, it's very simple, really. I mean, I mean, it's not it's not a literal you know, the, the term and the description, the concept. I mean, it's not literal. So, it's not about having a phobia of Islam. And this, you know, is something that is a great British tradition. You know, anti-Semitism isn't that you're anti-Semite. You know, it's you know, homophobia isn't that you're you know fearful of you know some kind of sexuality. You know, so, this, so these terms, you know, we, we use kind of non-literal terms to describe other similar phenomena. And for me, it, it, it's very simple, is that it, it's perfectly okay to, to criticize, uh, to disagree, and to condemn where, where appropriate, both the religion of Islam or, or individual Muslims or groups of Muslims. I, I don't think that's any problem whatsoever. I think it's perfectly fine to say I don't believe in your religion, you know, that I disagree with your religion, that, that your interpretation of certain things is, is different from mine. I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, I think that's actually what we would expect in a, in a mature society. But I think it's it's the, the way in which it's used, the way, the context and the tone as well. So if we start to look at, say, for example, if I say, well, I, I disagree with you because you're Muslim, if, it, if then I say, I disagree with you because, you know, you're Muslim, and I don't like all Muslims, and by that extension you start to make that, then you start getting into a, a much different area. You know, if, you, if I say to you, 
your interpretation of this issue may be different to mine. But if then you start saying, well, everything about Islam is bad, you know, Islam is, you know, a violent religion and so on, you know, it goes a little bit further. And you have to look at the context as well. You know, we, we, a lot of the people who are openly criticizing and sort of attacking the religion of Islam and, and Muslims are people that have some sort of platform, they have some sort of power base from which they can make these points of view. You know, they present a very one-sided uh, uh, sort of point of view. They use different rules and regulations and kind of benchmarks in terms of Muslims and the religion of Islam than what they do in terms of other religions. You know, so you, know, you can see this in some, of the, in some of those kind of discussions around sort of, you know, Britishness and British values. You know, some of the, the you know, different requirements that are placed upon Muslim communities. So I think it's, you know, so I think it's very easy to understand. It's very similar to racism. It's very similar to anti-Semitism. But it's just a new way of defining that sort of expression towards Muslims. Do you, do you think, though, that in some respects the question is somewhat problematic in and of itself? Because I mean, we don't, you don't see people saying, "How do you define racism?" or "How do you define anti-Semitism?" But we, we find time and time again that whenever the, you know, whenever the term Islamophobia is branded, a discussion always ensues about what is Islamophobia. I mean, why, why do we have this with Islamophobia but not other forms of Islamophobia? It, it, it's, it, you know, having looked at this topic, been researching this topic for 15 years, it's purely a device in which to undermine and not talk about the real issues. I mean, you're absolutely right. If we talk about a racist attack, if we talk about a homophobic attack, if we talk about sort of you know violence against women, you know, we, we understand these concepts. We don't need to have a definition before we try and understand it. We know that if somebody's attacked because of their skin colour, their nationality, or their heritage, walking down the road, you know, randomly and are beaten up, or there's violence used against them. We understand that as a racially motivated attack. If someone's walking down the street and they look Muslim, you know, um, as we know, I mean, Muslim women who, look, who are visible Muslim, you know, are, are more likely to become victims of Islamophobic hate crime at the street level than anybody else. You know, so if somebody is, is attacked in the street because of the way they look and because they look Muslim, then it, it, you know, it must be common sense. We must understand that as being Islamophobic. So, so what do you make of this um, this statement that some people make? Is that Oh, I don't hate I don't hate Muslims. I hate I've got a problem. I've got a problem with Muslims. I've got a problem with Islam. What do you make with that particular statement? That I mean, we've heard Tommy Robinson say things like that, and you know, I think Douglas Murray may have said things like that. So what, what what do you make of that statement that they made? I mean, I, I think it's I think it's this thing. It's a, it's about the context and the tone. I mean, if Tommy Robinson is is standing on a platform in front of uh, two thousand EDL supporters and said it's not Muslims, it's Islam, you know, that I have a problem with. I think that that's a very, very, you know, sort of, you know, dangerous sort of place to be. Because also as well, you know, if you look at some of the EDL literature, and, and having done some research on the EDL, you, you'll find that they would say, oh, we're only against extremist Muslims. But then when you actually scratch the surface and you, you start to ask, well, what does an extremist Muslim look like to the EDL? And the EDL will say somebody who prays five times a day, somebody who goes to the mosque, somebody who eats halal food. Now, I remember uh, Zaki Badawis that used to say when, when the term uh, fundamentalist Muslim was around, and I remember him standing up and saying, I'm a fundamentalist Muslim because I believe in the fundamentals of Islam. And, and all of those things, those practices, you know, praying, eating halal food, would actually just be fundamental parts of being a Muslim. So, you know, so it's about, very much about that context. I mean, and, I, you know, as I say, I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, if, if, we was in, if, if we was in an interfaith circle and the vicar from the church said, well, you know, I, I believe in Christianity and I don't believe in Islam, I think the context and the tone of the setting, you know, is that it's actually fine to say that. But when you're in front of, a, you know, 2,000 EDL supporters, I think it's completely different. So I think it is a way of kind of masking what you're trying to say, but people know what you're really saying. Right. If you look at things from the other angle, and if we, if, if we look at, you know, when, when, when Muslims are questioned about some of their basic theological beliefs, some Muslims in, in, interpret that as an Islamophobic attack, and I, mean, I spoke to you about this once before. You know, we had to be, you know, the, the example that always comes to my mind is that of Tom Holland uh, when he was doing this uh, this, uh, this television program for Channel Four, uh, which they had to take off air because many Muslims found it offensive. But Tom Holland's argument would obviously be that he's just putting an academic critique out there, and Muslims have misappropriated that as being Islamophobic. So, do you think that there are do you, do you think that there are instances where, where, where Muslims in Britain, uh, and worldwide in fact, sometimes uh, use the term Islamophobia to shut down legitimate criticism of the faith? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, I, there, there are a number of uh, sort of Muslim organisations who would use the term Islamophobia and sort of the charge of Islamophobia in a completely different way to what? So I would. Um, so, you know, that can be problematic, but, I mean, you know, if we look back 10, 20, 30 years, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, he's pulling the race card, or she's pulling the race card. Yeah. You know, you know, these sort of things, you know, you know are, are part of our kind of, you know, culture and our kind of understanding. I mean, what I, what I would say is that, you know, we really have to look at the kind of climate that we're in. And I think that, you know, something like, I mean, I spoke about the Tom Holland documentary. And I think that were the climate not the way it is at the moment, then actually that program may have been seen as not being Islamophobic. Yeah. But where we are at the moment, we're, we're in a climate where, in the political spaces, Muslims are openly vilified. You know, we're, we live in, you know, the media spaces. You know, and you know, you just got to look at the media. I mean, some research I did back in 2007, and we were comparing the amount of newspaper uh, articles and type of coverage around Muslims in Islam from 1996 to 2007. And what we saw was there was a 270% increase in news coverage around Muslims and Islam. And of that 270% increase, 95% of that was negative. So it was about war or violence or threat, you know, sort of oppression, about, you know, sort of, you know, abusing women's rights. Now, when you're in that climate, it's very difficult for even something that's kind of objective or tr aspiring to be objective to be seen in that way. So we, have, we, you know, it, it's again about this, this, this climate and about the tone of the sentiment. You know, so something like Tom Holland, which maybe I wouldn't necessarily kind of have a, have a problem with, I can then fully understand, though, given the climate that we live in, why it becomes problematic and why Muslims maybe react in such a way that they see that as being Islamophobic. So, so perhaps because the, because the Muslim community is under such a is under is under microscope, you know. Yeah. You know if, you know, if the Muslim community steps even a slight foot wrong, the media jumps onto it. So because they're in that sort of realm, they think, oh, everyone's against us. So that's why, sort of, uh, you know, even when people do, put, you know, put, put forward an academic critique, they it's misappropriated as being Islamophobic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's that issue as well around the kind of accentuation of someone's Muslimness yeah. and their accentuation as an inherent Muslimness, which is then attributable, attributable to all Muslims. And you know, I, I, you know, this this is something that come out in the, in the in the media was that actually the representation of Muslims is such that you know that, that you know, there will always be a mention that somebody if someone's doing something which is wrong or a criminal, it will be they are a Muslim. You know, so that will be stressed. You know, and that would then will kind of there will always be that inference that actually this is something which all Muslims are like. You know, I, th I think we you know after seven seven for example we saw the kind of the home the emergence of this kind of language around the homegrown bomber and this idea that the enemy was within and I think that before we've kind of seen that the, you know the kind of threat was over there it was a distance away from us whereas the, from 7-7 it's really kind of come inside so and, and, and I suppose the Lee Rigby uh, incident has just solidified that that notion yeah, isn't absolutely it? and, and it, it, it's it's always an interesting one because ever since I've started looking at this I always hear people say Oh, you know, Muslims should condemn this more. You know, Muslims should be more outspoken. And actually, every one of these incidents, incidents, you know, I know that there's lots of Muslims condemning it. But no matter how many times they, they condemn it, it's not enough. It's lost, yeah. And so, you know, it just becomes another stick with which to beat Muslim communities. And, and when you're under that much kind of pressure, when you're under that much scrutiny and kind of interrogation, it becomes very difficult to actually kind of look at things objectively. Coming back to the whole critiquing Islam thing once again, I want to ask you, where, where do you draw the line between between critiquing Islam, freedom of speech, and then stepping into the boundary of Islamophobia? Um, and someone who comes you know, to my mind is uh, Sam Harris in America. You know, he, he comes out with uh, uh, loads of statements, you know, he, and he believes that the ideology of Islam fundamentally is evil. Uh, needs to be challenged, needs to be critiqued in a in a in a in a in a, in a forceful way, um, and he obviously he, he he finds an insult to be labelled an Islamophobe. Yeah. Um, you know, so the question is, where do we draw this line between academic academic criticism and free speech and offending someone and being labelled an Islamophobe? Where do we draw that line? Yeah, I, I mean. I, I do a session at the university, so I'm based at the University of Birmingham. This is one of the areas we talk about because it's such a difficult area. 
And we talk about fence. And what I do is I give people, uh, to give the students, um, a kind of one piece of red paper, one piece of amber, one piece of green. And we talk about certain instances, and then we do a vote. If if it's fine, it's green. If you're uncomfortable with it, it's amber. And if you think this is like you know sort of you know kind of stepping over a line, it's red. And what's interesting is that most come out amber because we don't we don't know. You know, this is the problem with these issues is that we are in this kind of amber kind of grey area in the middle, and it's like how do we tell? You know, and I think that I, I think that I mean. I kind of have the view that I, you know, I, I have the right to be offended, but also I have the right to offend as well. And I think that with any of these things, you know, we, we need to have the kind of issue where, where it's fair and it's balanced. So, you know, I, um, so for example, the, the, the Muslim guys were burning the, the poppy. Now, now I, I, I can understand why people find that offensive. But then again, I can understand also why, you know, why, you know, um, EDO, I can see why they're offensive as well. And Brit first particularly, you know, sort of, you know, the invading of mosques, this new kind of thing, you know, in Dudley, which is just outside Bir Birmingham now, there's this idea that they're going to bury a pig and, you know, smear pig's blood over the land where a new mosque is going to be built. So I can understand these kind of issues, and I can understand why they're offensive. I mean, but it comes down to how do you apply that, you know, and so it becomes very difficult because what is it, and I think the issue really is about excitement, you know, so I think you should be able to say, you know, sort of, like, like Islam, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, that may offend, but where is it then about excitement? Because I think that's the, the, the issue, is if you're using those kind of statements to try and incite hatred amongst others, or to incite that kind of backlash, or to justify it, mm -hmm. I think it becomes really problematic. But, but even in incitement, I mean, let's, let's look at the, you know, the halal meat fiasco that took place a few months ago. Now, there were, there were some individuals who, who legitimately were you know, you know, raising concerns about you know, the, the animal welfare of, of halal slaughter, um, uh, and you know these individuals were very were very passionate about animal rights. But then you had a lot of other people jumping on that bandwagon as well, and sort of hiding behind, excuse me, the veil of that uh, of, of of that particular uh, of, of that particular um, criticism. Yes, I, I mean, in, uh, what I, I describe as I describe as smoke screens. You know these, these smoke screens in place. And, and the halal thing was was a really interesting one, and, and I fully respect the rights of you know sort of people who have sincere beliefs, you know, that, that you know, would would apply that to all terms of, of kind of animal rights and kind of animal welfare. But you know, it comes down to the motivation, and when when something like this becomes an issue, and you look on Britain First website or the EDL website, you suddenly got all of these kind of supporters of the EDL and Britain First suddenly being worried about you know where how an animal is killed. You know, when probably on a Saturday night they're probably drunk and they're probably going into a kebab shop and eating a halal burger without really much care, just as long as it's got more chili sauce on. You know, <laughs> you know, they, they, you know I, I kind of, you know, there's a real cynicism, there's a real cynical kind of element to it. Sorry. <laughs> obviously, we're obviously being monitored. This yeah. the other night, I, I, was to, I was at a similar event and this started happening, I, I feared we would be monitored, you know, so this many Muslims in one space, you know, it's a, you know, the security <laughs> service are probably watching at some place. Um, uh, <laughs> I forgot this is being recorded, yeah. probably. <laughs> so they're monitoring us anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, and, and I think it's about the kind of, you know, I, and I think it's about the motivations, and I think that, I, I think that a lot of people are, intelligent enough to understand that when you've got a far-right organisation suddenly taken on board a, you know, a kind of extremist, you know, and, and I just, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, when, when you have groups jumping on bandwagons, you know, I think that that becomes really, really problematic, and I, and I think that, you know, we are intelligent enough, and I think the British society is intelligent enough, you know, to, to understand this, and, and I, I'm going to give an example, and, and my, my, my kids are all um, teenagers, and uh, they take very little interest in the research I do, or the job I do, you know, they really don't want to know. But after the murder of Lee Rigby, they were really shocked with the kind of vitriol that was coming out through social media, yeah. and begun to show me this, and you know, there's some really horrific stuff there, you know, some really terrible stuff. What was interesting was that they kind of, they kept watching this, and what you saw, and this is, you know, this, you know, I'm quite pessimistic about the future in terms of Islamophobia, but you know, this, this gives me this real kind of sense of optimism. Was that you know, within about 24 hours, within about 48 hours, you know, young people were actually saying, look, you know, this is not all Muslims that have you know, murdered Lee Rigby, this is not all Muslims who are supporting these things. You know, so 
you know, so I did, I, you know, I hold on to this, that the actual British public are intelligent enough to realise that when the EDO or something campaign on, on animal rights, you know, that there's a, there's a whiff of uh, something wrong there. But, but I'm going to bring in the, the discussion about the media over here because you are saying, I mean, you're, you're quite right and something I, you know, I personally felt, I'm sure many people in the audience have perhaps felt the same thing as well, in that the, the way in which Islamophobia is sort of gaining progress is, is somewhat worrying. Um, and whilst there may well be people today who would be, you know, saying, oh, not all Muslims are like this, if the media continues playing this narrative saying that, well, you know, Muslims have done this, Muslims have done that, eventually people's perceptions may change, saying, well, actually, there must be some truth in what is being said, and over time, people may not be so forgiving. And that's one of the things that, you know, certainly I, I, I myself find quite worrying, and I'm sure other people, other Muslims do as well. Well, I, I think there always is that thing, there's no smoke without fire, and this is the real problem. You know? um, I mean, just to give a, give, give a few examples, um, so if you, if you think, think to yourself about when you see Muslim women in the newspapers, and I would imagine that the first image you think of is a Muslim woman, woman in all black wearing a niqab. And if you look at the kind of representation of the media, you'll find that around 95% of all images of Muslim women are that they wear the niqab. The reality is that the Guardian looked at the explored this last year and made some really good estimates, was that less than 1% of Muslim women actually wear the niqab in Britain. So the perception and the reality, you know, are, are completely at, at, at odds with each other. So when issues around the wearing of the niqab come into the media, you can see why people's anxieties kind of go up, because it, their perception is, is that this is a much bigger problem than it actually is. I give you an example, with the Department of Health earlier in the year, uh, there was this issue around sort of you know, um, there should be, you know, uh, patients should have the right not to be dealt with by somebody who is wearing the nikah. Now, you will know yourself that actually in a clinical environment, you know, is that there are very, very strict guidelines. And actually, you know, you know these guidelines can't be broached. And when we put in the freedom of, request, uh, freedom of information request asking how many complaints there have been in the NHS, there's actually been zero. So, so the media and the politicians can actually ramp up these issues when there's not an issue there, you know. And so the medium is very, very powerful in this. And one of the things I say is that, you know, if you walk into WH Smith's in the morning and you look at the Daily Express or the Daily Mail, and I'm being stereotypical because, you know. Uh, uh, Let's do stereotypes. Yeah, yeah, you know, stereotypes are true sometimes. Um, and you look at the, at the Daily Mail or the Daily Express, and if you look at it, and, and the headline says Jihad, and the image is a close cropped image of a Muslim woman, and you can just see her eyes, you can see the you know that that story is not going to be this woman in a niqab saved an elderly lady who was drowning. You know, plus she saved her cat and she took her milk in and she gave also, you know. You know that this is going to be, this woman did something wrong, Muslims did something wrong. So immediately, it's like it's like a trigger. And I say that, what, what, that for me, there's, there's a number of ways in which Islamophobia works. And there is this kind of, the very kind of aggressive, violent, street level kind of abuse side. But it's also an ideology as well. And, you know, we could spend the whole year doing a module on, uh, on what ideology means. But for me, it's about, it's kind of like a white noise that exists in society. It's kind of there in the background. So that when someone sees that image of the Muslim woman, it triggers that. And the white noise kind of comes in. And all of that bad stuff, Muslims are bad, Muslims are violent, women are oppressed, bloody, 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 all kind of comes in. And it shapes the way in which you understand stuff. And so that, that for me is the way in which the media works, you know. And it's very difficult to actually pinpoint when the media are being absolutely Islamophobic. But it's the creation of that white noise and that yeah. constant feeding of the white noise for me is the problem. Right, so I mean, obviously we're exploring, you know, we've been talking about the role of the media. But what I really want to ask you from your experience, getting to the, you know, to the crux of the issue, what are the driving factors behind Islamophobia. So what is it that would make someone Islamoph you know, Islamophobic? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, that, that we, we, have to be, we have to be honest, you know, and that there are certain people in society who have very unsavory traits, you know, um, and they will be prejudiced and discriminatory to anyone or anything that is slightly different. And I think this is the, this is the issue here, because it's about difference and not diversity. And sometimes we, we get a bit confused with this. You know. Diversity actually, you know, is something that, you know, I, I look across the room tonight and there's a lot of visual diversity. You know. 
and there's, there's a diverse group. Now, in, at, at that level, it's, it's not a problem. It's when you start earmarking parts of that diversity as being different. And so if I start looking around now and I start saying, well, you know, some, some people look like this, which means they're different. And with that difference becomes problems, you know, and that really is where, where which underpins it. Now what we've got is we, we, we've got a society, we've got a climate where, you know, sort of people are becoming increasingly intolerant, you know, people are becoming, you know, feel increasingly pressured. You know, we've got austerity cuts which are, you know, really affecting, you know, people's lives. But what we know from, his, from history is that it tells us that when people, you know, when it, there's an economic downturn, when people are suffering, when inequalities are getting, you know, kind of bigger, that actually it's very easy to look for scapegoats. And you see, you'll see this, you know, if you, if you look at sort of um, the way in which the BNP used to uh, campaign, you know, when it was at its kind of zenith around 2007, was it would do this thing called bread, bread and po uh, politics. And what it would do is, it would go into the areas where the mainstream parties weren't going to go. It would go onto the housing estates, the kind of really deprived areas, and it would go in there and it would use Islam and Muslims as a scapegoat. So it would say, look at the way in which you're living, you know, have you seen that mosque down the road? Well, that was 16 million pounds. There, there didn't need to be any truth or evidence in there. Yeah. But actually would use that as a way in which to kind of like sort of bring people on side. And you know, you, you see this all the time, you know, oh Muslims get away with everything, you know, Muslims are trying to, you know, Islamify the country, you know, it's like Islamification of Britain. You know, this idea, you know, there's always got to be a bad guy, there's always got to be a scapegoat. Now you can see some of this, I mean, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the, the uh, sociologist, uh, cultural studies uh, uh, sociologist uh, Stuart Hall. And if you look back to the 1970s, you know, what's being said about Muslims now, it's very similar to obviously being said about young black men in the 70s, you know, this idea around mugging the state, you know, is that black men are coming over here taking out women, their jobs, and so on and so on. The difference, what I would say, is that what's really driving the issue of Islamophobia now, so on one level we can say it's like a kind of very similar thing, but what's driving it is that you know, the Islamophobia in the contemporary setting has a global dimension. And so what's being said about Muslims in Syria, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, or Central Africa is being also attributed to Muslims in, in Britain as well. So the kind of differentiation has gone. All Muslims are the same. And just to give you an example, um, so uh, uh, in Birmingham we've had the Trojan Horse Affair this year, uh, yeah. where uh, it was an Islamic takeover of schools um, that never turned into an Islamic takeover because there was no evidence. It suddenly become about extremism in school. What it began as and what it ended as was two completely different things. It's very interesting. It, yeah, it seems it, it's amazing that neither the media or the politicians picked up on that. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Though. But if you, if you, I, I don't know if any of you picked up on, on, on this because what what was said was that there was this issue around alleged extremism in Birmingham schools, and there's been very little evidence. In fact, hardly any evidence that this taking place. But Tony Blair made a speech kind of halfway through this and he said what you see in Birmingham schools is directly linked to what we see in Boko Haram. <laughs> and so this was at the time when Boko Haram were alleged to have um, uh, kidnapped 200 young girls and he was saying, he said he made the direct link, what's going on with Boko Haram is what's going on in Birmingham schools. And this is being said, you know, without any interrogation, without any question whatsoever. And this is being reported in the news. So the global dimension of Islamophobia is really crucial. That's really where it, it's kind of pushed it up to, a, to, to the next level. We'll, we'll come on to the role of politicians a bit later on, but just coming back to this thing about the, drive, the driving factors of Islamophobia. An interesting thing we saw uh, not too long ago, um, you know, on an armistice day was the emergence of this uh, poppy hijab. Um, and you wrote an article, I believe, for the Huffington Post. Was, was, it, was, it, new, was yeah, new states, new for the yeah. New States? And um, you, 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 made, you, you made the point that um, this poppy hijab, if anything, fed into this whole sort of Islamophobia narrative. And I found, it, again, another very interesting idea. Um, can you elaborate on that? I mean, because I mean, m much of the discussion that was coming from from various writers was, oh, why are we being forced into this, this whole, this whole thing? But you actually said that, if anything, and the pe ironically, the people who are behind the poppy hijab may well have felt that this was something to tackle Islamophobia. Yeah. But, but you actually said the opposite, saying that actually, 
it may be feeding into the narrative. So yeah, why yeah. Not um, uh, so so if you haven't if you haven't read the article, and I, I'm sure a lot of you haven't, it was probably the most popular <laughs> for the wrong reasons. One of the most popular articles I've ever written. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it increased the amount of backlash. I, I mean, I'm used to it from the far right. Um, I'm not always used to it so much from, from Muslim groups <laughs> and organisations. So, so, so I, I caused a, a big stir with this. So, so basically, there was some. Uh, there was the, this. Uh, so, do you all know about the poppy hijab? So there was this for for Armstrong's day. There was the suggestion that that it would be a good idea to um, uh, design a hijab for Muslim women that was covered in poppies. And I, I saw it, and the first time I saw it, I, I, I was, I was, it was almost like I, I, you know, I, I was taken aback by it. And, and it was just like, this is maybe the worst idea I've ever seen in my life. You know, like, so, yeah, you know, and, and it, was, it, was, it was just, I, I, couldn't get, I really couldn't get my head around it. Because it was, it was being launched by the Islamic Society of Britain. And, you know, I, you know, I have no, no problems with the Islamic Society of Britain. You know, but, but, it was the language that was being used with it. So it was being launched, and it was about this is kind of you know sort of showing that we stand against extremists, that you know, this is you know sort of us standing together, you know, to, to silence the minority of extremists. And, and I just, the, the question that came to me, well in fact I, I can't take I can't take credit for it. A friend of mine said to me when I was talking to him about it, he said, Why can't a Muslim woman just wear a poppy like the rest of us if she wants to uh, remember? Yeah. And it was like, yeah, what, why can't she? You know, because actually, if you do want to remember, just wear a poppy. You know, you don't need to wear a big thing. So, so the more I thought about this, the more I felt as though I needed to respond to it. And so, and what, what for me it was was that it, it, it obviously it was driven by Muslims. And, and some of the some of the groups behind it said to me, "Are you saying that Muslims are Islamophobic?" And I was like, "No, I'm not saying Muslims are Islamophobic, but they can play into the discourses. They can play into the processes." of Islamophobia. So if you've got politicians who are saying, you need to prove you're British, you know, we don't believe that Muslims are British, so you need to, you know, we need British values, we need you to make a statement, we need you to make it clear that you're British. And, and I'm looking at some of the women here because like, they're, they're more visible. So for you, you have to make more of a statement of your Britishness than I do. I never had to say that I'm British, you know, I'm just British because I was born here, I'm white, I'm, you know, and all these other things. But because you're Muslim and you look Muslim, that you in some way have to prove your Britishness. And so for me, it was about actually sort of this idea that actually not only would Muslim women have to do this, but also the reappropriation of a religious piece of clothing, you know, so that takes on kind of spiritual, religious, theological connotations, was suddenly being reappropriated as a form of actual remembrance. You know, and I was thinking, well, what, what do we have? Do we have, like, sort of, you know, uh, poppy crucifixes? You know, do we have poppy kippers? You know, like, I mean, you know, where, the, where does this kind of go? You know, sort of poppy turbans for Sikhs, you know. And, it, you know, and it was just like, there would never be this, this, there would never be this pressure or requirement on any other community. And there would be huge outcry. I mean, imagine if there was, like, a poppy uh, turban, you know, and it was like, well, you know, as a Sikh man, I want you to prove your Britishness and your allegiance to... To you know, to Britain by this, but there was another element to it as well. And what it was saying that in the articles, it was launched in the Daily Mail. It was the Daily Mail and the Independent, which was really interesting, and it said that this was also about you know supporting British troops. Now, I, as a British person, with some of the things that British troops have been involved in in the last 10, 15 years, and I can say that. But it seemed again that another thing is about well, not only do you have to prove you're British. But also, you can't criticise foreign policy because the minute you criticise foreign policy, well, you know you're you're being disloyal, you're being a traitor, and that means that you're a threat to us from within. And so, for me, it was that this this thing that was being created. I mean, I can't even believe that they, that the people behind it thought it was a good idea. You know, that, you know, I thought about it more and more and more. And the more I think about it, it's like who sat down and went, "This must be a really good idea." You know, someone around the table should have said, "Really." You know, so, so it's about the, the way in which it fed into the kind of wider debates. Yeah, and I, and I suspect, you know, you know, obviously, the ISB, when they, uh, when they supported the the hijab, were probably were doing it with, with good intentions. I, you know, we, you know, we, they were seeing it as something to tackle Islamophobia and extremism. But actually, as you say, there's a point you put forward quite strongly. It may well be, it may well be doing the total opposite, and we will come back and talk about 
at the end yeah, of the discussion. I mean, you know, my, my criticism was never about the intelligence. My yeah. criticism was about the way in which it would impact on what the message was sending out. And just, well, just one other thing on that. What was interesting was that the, the, the head of the ISB is Sugra Ahmed, and now Sugra Ahmed is, is a female. What was really interesting is that the, the, the Daily Mail obviously didn't believe that a woman, a Muslim woman, could ever lead, you know, could ever lead a, a Muslim organisation. So they called uh, Sugra, uh, sorry, like Mister Sugra, Mr. Ahmed, Mr. and then it was like he said, and he said, you know, and I just thought myself, this this is actually really indicative of the, of the way in which the media understands things. That it's okay for this woman to wear this, but let's not give her a voice, you know. Yeah. Let's give the man a voice who's talking. And then, you know, so, so it was really problematic on many levels. Right now. Just coming on to some of the things, you know, so we've, we've, we've had one example in which an organisation has tried to tackle Islamophobia, but, uh, you know, I don't think it did, it did the job that it was supposed to do. Another initiative was this cross-parliamentary working group against anti-Muslim hate, uh, and this is a, a, uh, a group that you were actually part of until very recently, um, and, uh, you know, you, you left that and you wrote about that in the, in the Huffington Post. Why did you actually leave them? What was it exactly that made you think, you know what, I can't be part of this group anymore? Yeah, I, I, I'll give a little bit of a, a kind of overview of the way, of the way in which it works and then and, and, and come on to that. So, um, just before, before the last election, so around about the end of 2009, there was, there was a large uh, kind of coming together of a number of different kind of concerned individuals and groups, both Muslim and non-Muslim and, and academics and, and sort of commentators, who actually were pushing for the establishment of an all-party parliamentary group on Islamophobia. And what this would do is this would give a space for parliamentarians to look at the evidence and see if there was, there was a problem and if there was any need for some sort of uh, kind of response to that. So shortly after, um, so, so November 2010, uh, the APPG was launched. And in line with the APPG on uh, anti-Semitism, there was the decision to set up a cross-government working group as well. Now, so you have the all-party parliamentary group, the APPG, which is like coming from parliamentarians, and there's evidence submitted there, and they have hearings and so on. And then there's a cross-government working group that kind of sits within the Department for Communities and Local Government, and that comprises uh, senior civil servants, it has governmental representation on, it has Muslim representation, Muslim organisations, um, and you know, so academics, people with kind of some sort of expertise, and also a number of other groups as well, civil society organisations that would be involved in kind of tackling hate and so on in, the, in, the society, in society. Now, this, this was three years ago when I, when I was invited to join, and I, I saw this as being a wonderful opportunity because, you know, for, the, for 10 years there had been a lot of campaigning and a lot of advocacy work. And, and this was something that really hadn't come into the kind of political spaces. And if you, if you think back to New Labour, whilst they spoke about kind of tackling discrimination on the basis of religion or belief, really did they actually to, to, to speak about the issue of kind of Islamophobia? And I think there's only one time when they actually used the term, and it was John Denham. Um, so, you know, this, this was a clear shift, you know, in, in the way in which government was thinking about this. And so, when this, when this opportunity was presented to me, it was something that I felt I had to take because I felt that I could contribute something positive to it. I felt that I had good research evidence. I would build up you know, a decade of evidence in, in terms of what the processes were, the drivers, the manifestations, the impact. And convince and, MPs that they need to do something yeah, about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in a really kind of constructive way. And so I joined, um, and, and I was basically part of this for three years. And as, as part of this, um, I, I, I think I submit. So, I think it's submitted around about 12 different pieces of uh, written evidence in terms of reports and, and kind of uh, documents. Plus, I also made uh, sort of four uh, oral uh, uh, presentations to um, the All Party Parliamentary Group, and all of this is available as well. You know, so this is all open. You know, available to, to, to everyone. It is available via, via my website and online because I want people to be able to take this on because I want people to have this evidence so they can see that this is a real phenomenon. And it was really after about a year when we kind of like sort of, we really hadn't done anything. We met a lot, we talked a lot. Um, at the start there was the comment which was made to us that nothing is on the table but then nothing is off the table either so we can look at these issues. Um, we can we can kind of sort of you know, have this kind of very safe space where we can be frank and open. And after about a year, I realised that 
it was really beginning to move in a very particular way. And it was really about kind of moving towards the problem being solved by Muslims. Now, if we look at if we look at any of these kind of discriminatory phenomena, whilst the communities that kind of being targeted have a role to play, they're also the victims. So you know, victims can't always be the solution to the problem. And there is this kind of suggestion that actually, well, if you're the, if you're to blame, you've got to sort it out. So you know, so you know, it's kind of self-perpetuating cycle. And we increasingly move towards this kind of thing where you know, sort of government were kind of. Um, slowly kind of moving towards, well, if Muslims send out more positive messages about Islam, and more positive messages about Muslims, and we, we kind of have a kind of positive kind of, you know, narrative or discourse coming out, then this will tackle Islamophobia. Now, you know, we only need to look at history. Homophobia, sexism, racism, these are not tackled by saying nice things, you know. These are tackled actually by, by real hard Evidence, you know, by evidence, by making a case, by making change, by influence, by you know, changing the attitudes and the narratives. And so, what we found is that there were things such as the big iftar. Now, I have no problem with any of these issues, but the big iftar, you know, opening the doors of mosques, you know, sharing food, and you know, during Ramadan, is not going to tackle Islamophobia. No. You know, we have things like sort of, you know, uh, the poppy day. You know, the the, the Muslim soldiers who fought, fought in the world wars. Again, this, these are really important messages. These are really important stories to get out. But they're not going to stop Islamophobia. They're not going to stop somebody walking down the street and spitting on a Muslim woman, you know, or pulling her hijab off. I mean, this is the thing. There are so many community projects that, um, you know, positive community projects that are taking place. I mean, I know, for example, the University of Sheffield Islamic Circle does things with, with you know, with, a local, with, with the local schools over here. You know, they do outreach work, and many organize, many Muslim organisations do things, but these things don't get out because fundamentally the media don't want to report them because yeah. people don't listen to it. Yeah, and, and it, this this was this was the way we were moving, and you know, and for me, I, I was I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable, and and if honest, I was looking to you know, I questioned my role there, you know, eighteen months ago because it's like. Well, I'm giving this evidence. But I'm making just... recommendations, and there was there was nothing really. There was nothing coming forward. I mean, I mean, government did fund the Tell Mama project. So, so Tell Mama, if you don't know, is, is Mama stands for measuring anti-Muslim attacks. And this was something that I recommended back in 2008. Was that we needed something to kind of monitor Islamophobia in the same way that the Community Security Trust monitors anti-Semitism. Jewish communities, because we know that around 70% of Islam, Islamophobic attacks are not reported to the statutory services. You know, we know that Muslim women are not going to go to the police. We know that Muslim men are not going to go to the police. You know, this real fear that if they go to the police, suddenly they're going to be monitored and they're going to ask questions and so on. So we, we know that around 70% of actually Islamophobic crime doesn't get reported. So we needed a third-party <coughs> reporting mechanism. We needed this kind of safe space where Muslims felt they could go and actually report. So the government funded this, but of course then they, they withdrew the funding. There was lots of politics involved in this. You know, the, the kind of the, what was going on in, in the kind of public spaces, and the, you know, was also quite different to what was going on behind closed doors. And you know, that's that's another story for, for those those to explore. But what what was really worrying me was that we were actually not moving anywhere. And increasingly, what I was finding was that you had a number of representatives around the table. Who were, who were scared to question government. And this really came to a head this year. So there was about, there must have been about 15 of us on this panel. I wanted us to, I was always open that I was a member of the panel. I was always open, of the working group, sorry. I was always open with why I submitted. I was always open with when, when I attended meetings because this is what we need. We need a profile. <coughs> when things happened, when Mohammed Salim was murdered in Birmingham last year, when three nail bombs were put away, or went off outside uh, mosques in Birmingham, uh, around the outskirts of Birmingham last year, the working group didn't want to respond to this. And I was like, well, why are we not responding to this? Why are we not actually condemning this? Why are we not standing up and saying, this is the case for us? They will not do it. When, um, uh, when, the, when the, the NHS thing with the NICAR, I said we need to actually send a letter, we need to meet with the Minister for Health. Only three members of the group would put their name to the letter. Uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people over here actually have heard of this cross-parliamentary working group against anti-Muslim hate? That's two hands out of a room of about 100 And I, don't, I was going to say, of those who do, do you know anyone that sits on it? No. 
I mean, there was, there was a whole debate around whether we should have a space, we should have a website. I mean, if you look at the APPG on Islamophobia, there's a website there, there's reports. There. I, I actually remember hearing you on radio talking about it once, and I remember Googling and I couldn't find anything. No. Well, when I, when I resigned, I, when I was resigned, I, I was on the BBC because the BBC interviewed me, and they said, in the, in the spirit of balance, we tried to get another member on from the from the group. We couldn't find anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the thing, you know, nobody knows. I mean, it's it's, it's faceless. I mean, you know, and, and you've got you know, you've got representatives from Muslim organisations there who who are supposed to be advocating for you know everyday ordinary Muslims. You've got people who are sitting at that table saying. We're experts. If you're an expert, why are you not speaking up? Why are you not talking up? And, and I've become increasingly uncomfortable because for me it seemed that there was a number of people there that were, were actually much more inclined to keep their, their, their seat at the table with government than they were with actually tackling the issues that were meant to be, just, meant to be there for them. Just on this relationship with government, uh, and I want to look a bit more at the role of government and politicians, and we spoke about Tony Blair uh, uh, a bit earlier. Um, and we look at some of the things that we see emanating from government. I mean, we, I mean, famously, Hollowbone's bill on banning the niqab. Then the way in which uh, the Trojan horse tobacco was managed. I mean, you make, you make, you made a very interesting point about how it started off as one thing, yeah. and then not as something else. We like the Iraq War, actually. <laughs> um, well, the war on terror, you yeah. know, in Afghanistan. I mean, I, I did actually say to to friends, you know, it's like. What exactly did we go into Afghanistan for? Because at the end, it was like it was completely different, you know, than what it was at the start, you know. But looking at all of these things, do you think the current coalition government has an Islamophobic undertone to it? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I, I mean, you know, I, I've looked at I've looked at new new Labour policy discourses as well. And, and there's some, there's some, you know, it's, 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 there's some very, there's some very bizarre things there as well. And, and I think, I think what, what, what I would say is that rather than, rather than say um, kind of the, the, the coalition is, the, as a kind of Islamophobic underpinning is that actually what we've seen over the last 15 years in British politics is a kind of underpinning of a very kind of, uh, kind of suspicion around Muslims and around Muslim communities. But see, you think that's, that's the point, Chris, isn't it? Because they, you know, politicians will argue that we have this. I'm just putting there yeah. because they'll, they'll say we have this very real, this very real threat of Islamic extremism in Britain. Um, you know, and we, obviously this week we've seen Theresa May launching her proposals, um, and you know we, we need to do something. We, we need to have legislation in place to tackle extremism, and obviously that's what the Trojan horse thing has turned into as well. This this thing about nursery kids being uh, being radicalised, um, and you know spot checks taking place in schools. Um, so their, their narrative is going to be that actually there is this problem of religious extremism. We have to tackle it because it's a very dangerous ideology. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I, can, I can come back to that very easily. You know, we, have, we have to accept in Britain, as indeed in many other places, you know, in, in Europe and, and North America as well, is that they, in, there are clearly some individuals who wish to, to, to bring about some atrocity or some sort of terror act you know, in the name of their understanding or their interpretation of what Islam tells them or their understanding of the Muslim. If we look at all of the successes in thwarting these, these atrocities or these terrorist attacks and so on, how have they actually come about? They've come about through intelligence. They've been intelligence-led. Now, you know, this is what, the, you know, my argument is, is, is actually that is the way forward, you know, is through intelligence, you know. But then we have, like, you know, these kind of weird programs about kind of prevent, about some trying to, you know, spot the telltale signs of a, of a radical. I mean, but as, as a university lecturer, you know, I've had the training where I'm supposed to be able to spot someone who's vulnerable to radical extremism. Now, I went through the training and, you know, it's, you know, you know, you know, the, the, the kind of telltale signs of someone with a beard, you know, I only have to look in the mirror, you know, maybe I'm on the way, you know, to, to radicalism, you know, like, so, you know, these kind of things, you know, so, there, you know, there, there is a kind of, we have, we have to acknowledge there's a very real issue there, but it seems to me that actually, sort of, intelligence is the way forward, because that is where the successes have come, and actually this vilification of, of communities, this kind of constant scrutiny of communities at large, you know, this constant kind of questioning and interrogating and kind of like sort of marginalising, problematising of all Muslims without differentiation is, is something that actually with our discourse, with, our, with, with nuance, we could actually avoid. But, but just to come back to you, you say that, I mean obviously with the 
extremism thing that uh, intelligence is the way forward. Yeah. But what the government um, said, what we've been seeing this week, is what is a message that seemed to be giving the British public, is that you are the eyes and ears of the intelligence services. So if you spot something, then you know, you, you know, you yeah. have to tell us about it. And this is the thing that that's why they're going into all these public institutions. I mean, you know, as uh, as uh, as hospital doctors, we've had prevent training as well. Um, uh, they're going to schools, they're going to cinemas and shopping centres. So they, they want the public to be part of the intelligence services in some in some way, shape, or form. And the problem with that is that you're, you're feeding into that suspicion in a, in a, in a public setting. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough, I mean, being from London and being old enough to remember the IRA, I mean, you know, this was, you know, living in London and getting on the tube, you know, you, this, this was very, very much a reality, you know, you know and, and people are, you know, aware of these things, you know, we, we, you, know, you, you know, there was always that thing, you would be aware of suspicious packages and so on, you know, and these sort of things were always embedded in there. The problem you have here is that actually, if you look at the last 10 years, the amount of people that have kind of been, you know, not, not even killed, and I, I you know, and using these is always a dodgy kind of area, you know, when you start saying only this number of people have died or whatever, you know, so that's, that's a worrying benchmark. But if you look at the number of terrorist atrocities in, in Britain and the people who have been injured or died, it's actually less in the last 10 years than it's been for about 60 years. Mm -hmm. And yet if you look at the suspicion and the kind of fear of terrorism, it's much, much higher, you know, it's higher than it's ever been. So there, there's clearly there, some sort of disparity between the fear, the actual fear, and what the perceived, you know, the, what the perceived reality is. And I think that this is the problem. You see, with, with, with nuance, with actual sort of intelligence, you can actually, you can, people are aware of these things. You know, people are aware of it. But it's some kind of like ramping up and ratcheting up to the fear levels, I think becomes problematic. And then that feeds into the fears and anxieties that then can get channeled into Discrimination. Okay, now just just before we open the, the floor up for questions, I just want to ask you one final thing. But let's say, for example, David Cameron is watching this lecture, and he then thinks, you know what, I need to speak to Chris because we need to take we need to start doing something meaningful about Islamophobia. What would he say to David Cameron about the sort of things that we really need to do to really take to start managing Islamophobia in a more serious fashion? Well, what, I, what I'm saying to him is, is that look, you know, this, this is not, there, there's no short-term answer to this. So there has to be political will. And this was also something that I found with the cross-government working group. You know, at the start there was political will, and increasingly I fear that there was no political will whatsoever. We need to sit down, we need to look at evidence, we need to have conversations, we need to have open and equal conversations. And in many ways there needs to be this issue of going beyond the simplistic, you know, we have to look at this, we have to, it has to be an investment of resources. You know, if you look at sort of, you know, racism, the Commission for Racial Equality wasn't a cheap move, you know. This was about investment. This was actually about government trying to, you know, get the evidence together to shape the public debate. You know, and, you know, if, if governments are going to do this in a kind of peaceful approach, it's never going to be, never going to be tackled. And so for me, it would be this thing, you know, we need to sit down, we need to look at the evidence, we need to look at what is, what is possible, what is not possible, we need to look at the strategies, and we need to bring people on board who are committed to doing this, you know, to tackling this issue, whether they are politically kind of popular or favourable to the government or not, but about bringing the right people on board, about bringing people on who are actually committed to changing things, and not just getting people around the table because they've got some sort of representative value or that the government knows they're going to agree with them. Brilliant. Chris, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, um, and with that, we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, what I was thinking about doing in the first instance was taking questions, perhaps three at a time, and then getting Chris to answer them uh, in, <coughs> yeah, in, in one go. So if, if we have, if who wants to start with the first question? Yes. Okay, um, so that's question number one. Question number two? Yes? Uh, you said towards the end of uh, the talk, towards the end of the dialogue, that uh, combating these um, you know, extremists, uh, you need intelligence for that. Do you mean intelligence am I or intelligence up here or both? <laughs> 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 okay. yeah, yeah, it's going to play a word over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Safi, yeah. Um, it's interesting when you mentioned that. 
that some of the efforts that they've been doing with them, for example, I mean, mosques giving food and the halal, that hasn't helped to tackle Islamophobia. And I can kind of see where you're coming from, but um, <coughs> could you kind of expand on that more? Where you know, it, it, it seems like a lovely idea, and you can kind of appreciate the notion that, that people who, who came up with that idea, that, you know, you give out food, people come together and they have a conversation. I mean, is this causing harm? Do you think that? Do you think this is causing harm, or do you think that it's just not as beneficial as it could be? Okay, uh, first point, maybe the first and third ones I can respond to together. Yeah. They kind of, they kind of, sorry, so I'll respond to the third point first. <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with sharing food. But, but I don't think that it's... it's I, <laughs> yeah, that, see that again, that, see language is very difficult. You know, you get yourself in a, you know, tied up in knots. So I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with, with you know, having the big iftar. But I don't think it can be seen as a government policy for tackling Islamophobia. You know, this is something that's going on anyway. You know, this is what this is what different mosques and, and Muslim groups and Muslims as neighbours, as ordinary people, are doing anyway. You know, they're, they're you know they're doing these kind of things. As, you know, that are out there. If if government wants to tackle this stuff, it's not about encouraging more Muslims to eat more food. You know, I, I think there has to be strategies, there has to be guidelines, there has to be initiatives. And there has to be a kind of a top-down approach that kind of that tries to change the narrative. And, you know, and we've seen it over the last few weeks, the way in which the kind of issue around immigration, the way in which the politicians talk about immigration, you know, I guarantee that at the grassroots level, it's becoming more and more tense and more and more, you know, sort of problematic. And, you know, so, so I think that, you know, like, there's that thing there, you know. And, and if we look at it historically, you know, it, you know I, I mean, I always, I, I always say this, you know, so, you know, we didn't tackle homophobia by telling people, you know, what gay people did, or you know, we didn't tell, you know, we didn't tackle racism by saying, you know, hey, let's let's see rice and peas, you know, you know, it, you know, it, you know, there's a real issue there, you know. So it's 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 not about what goes on in the mosque, you know. Let's open the doors and let people, you know, people will that people that will work on a very local level, and you know, there's always that thing. It's like you know, like oh, you know, once you get to know someone, you know them as a person not as the other, you know, so that works there. But it, what I was trying to say was that it, it's that kind of governmental level, you know, th this can't be a proxy for government doing something. This is actually something that's, that's kind of there anyway, so, so that, that was fine. In, in terms of Muslim organisations, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's an awful lot which is being done already, you know, and, and there's an awful lot of good work that's, that's been done. And Muslim organisations like, you know, faith groups, you know, across the whole faith spectrum, actually do some fantastic work in terms of kind of social capital, you know, in terms of sort of making a difference in their local communities. I mean, we have, um, uh, we, we've got food banks in Birmingham, which are, which are run by churches, which are run by mosques, and these are not exclusive to, you know, sort of, you know, people of a particular faith. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, is that actually the, the people who go to the mosque for the food bank have a completely different view of Muslims. You know, since they've been going to that mosque, because like actually, you know, they be, people, you know, Muslims become people, they become human. You know, it, it's not the other anymore. You know, so so, so that, that that's really good. I mean, I, I guess what I would say, you know, being brutally honest, is I think that at that kind of top level, where influence, where your where Muslim organisations are engaged with the government and working together, with this, you know, uh, uh, trying to tackle this, is there's got to be collaboration. And there's got to be an overcoming of the differences. There are huge issues between Muslim organisations at that kind of top level. This Pol group, the politics between them. Yeah, the politics of, of, of kind of the, the Muslim communities. You know, and, and this is another problem as well. Government still thinks that there's one Muslim community. And actually you've got many, many different Muslim communities. You know, and, but actually there needs to be a coming together to tackle this issue. There needs to be a consistent voice and saying, we'll, we'll put all our differences, we'll put the politics aside, and actually we'll attack with Islamophobia because this issue is so big, we have to stand together. And what happens is, when you, you, at the moment, you've got so much competition between different groups, you've got money being dangled by the government. You know, I always said, you know, after 7-7, after you know, the Muslim Council of Britain, you know, New Labour kind of washed his hands of the uh, Muslim Council of Britain. Now, the Muslim Council of Britain are not, you know, without criticism, but all organisations, all individuals, you know, can be criticised. 
But then what did government do? I mean, <coughs> government said, oh, we're only going to work with moderate Muslims. You know, so, so you have an influx of organizations going, oh, we're moderate Muslims. And then you have a the next group, we're moderate mainstream Muslims. You know, then the next group, we're moderate mainstream uh, middle of the road Muslims. And then the next group going, we're ex-Islamists, you know, so, you know, and you know where the funding is going to go, you know. So, so, you know, so this, you know, so, you know, the, the kind of competition, you know, it's almost a kind of legacy of, of, you know, colonialism, you know, it's divide and rule, you know, and actually play each other off against each other and let's not tackle the real issue, you know. So that needs to stop, you know, really, because that is the way forward, you know, working across those those political divides, you know, and those differences, you know, we can have difference of opinions, you know, on, on other issues, but on Islamophobia, we've got a very consistent and solid kind of, you know, sort of, you know, bore against this. In terms of intelligence, um, I was guessing, like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a good point, actually. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess I'd like a little bit more intelligence in society, you know, <laughs> you know like, so, this sort of intelligence, you know, because, you know, I, I do think that there is a, you know, yeah, actually, when you when you try and intellectualize Islamophobia, like any discrimination or you know, so discriminatory phenomenon, it kind of falls apart a little bit. You know, you know, if you look at racism and some of the way in which racism was justified, actually, if you kind of intellectualize it, it it's kind of you know, it doesn't really hold up. And I think the same is. But I was I was talking about that kind of intelligence led. You know, what's going on in the communities? And you know, there's been a number of arrests and successful convictions in Birmingham. And Westminster's police have said that this actually comes from within Muslim communities. So this is not that it's, you know, the intelligence services and the police against Muslims. It's actually everyone working together on this, you know. So it's about that kind of intelligence driven, you know, that kind of, you know, the security services, the statutory services, you know, the police, and working with communities in that way, you know, not in this kind of top-down, you know, bang the people with the stick. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what is, what is the government and the society actually gaining? Like, by being Islamophobic, um, other than increasing hate, is there an alternative agenda? And uh, obviously, you know, it seems to be money, like politics in the end day. And what's your opinion on that? Um, another thing is, do you think that um, it's sort of counteractive um, and increases the alienation between the communities? Like, you know, right now, what's going on in the media, etc. This whole concept of Islamophobia, um, is that actually further alienating things? And, uh, what do you think about that? Okay. That's one question. <coughs> yep. Uh, what is the best thing we can do as individuals to tackle Islamophobia? Yep. And perhaps answering that question, because everyone, <coughs> I presume most people are students, so what, what can the Muslim student body actually do? Uh, that's, that's quite an important question. Uh, any other questions? Yep. That was my question. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I always get worried when people are reading off of a piece of paper with their questions because I think, oh, they've prepared that beforehand. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 there's an agenda, you know, see, the suspicion and paranoia, you know, seeps in, you know. Um, okay. Um, maybe maybe they're, they're the ones monitoring us. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, well, it was also up there, you know, on that, on that speaker, you know. Um, um, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, what, 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 what's in it for government? I, it, it's, it's an interesting one because you, you kind of get into conspiracy theories, and I'm not, I, you know, I don't like conspiracy theories, you know. Um, but I'll give you a conspiracy theory. Um, <laughs> um, we, we, um, so, Trojan Horse, for example. Um, did, did anybody, does anybody know that Michael Gove wrote a book called Celsius Seven Seven? Yeah. Um, do you know what one of the chapters was called? Uh, the chapter was called Trojan Horse, and um, it was about Muslims infiltrating, you know, institutions and, and British society. And, and then, of course, like seven years later, we get oh, the, the Operation Trojan Horse, and uh, oh, Michael Gove is uh, the minister. Of just, just on that one point, the one thing that I actually found quite interesting was that the letters referred to this Trojan Horse plot. I've never heard Muslims talking about Greek mythology ever. So <laughs> one of the things I found particularly, I was like, this could have been written by Muslims because I've never, I haven't even heard anyone speak about Greek mythology. Yeah. So. Well, well, the other thing is, when we, all, uh, myself and a colleague, uh, uh, we read it, and there wasn't, there was no inshallahs in there. You know, yeah. there's always going to be an inshallah. You know? <laughs> yeah. if, you know, if it's written from one Muslim to another, you know, like because that's the caveat. You know, if it doesn't happen, inshallah. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know we've, we've got a safety net there. You know. <laughs> But I mean, it, it clearly wasn't written, 
you know, by a Muslim, from a Muslim organism. So, I mean, this, this was something which is, you know, you, you know, you know anyone who's, who's, you know, sort of got any sort of, you know, you go back to some point of intelligence, you know, would know that this, this is something which was a hoax. And, and Westminster's police came out with this very soon and said, you know, this, this, this is probably going to be a hoax. So, I mean, in terms of government, you know, I, I, you, you do kind of get into that realm of conspiracy theories, you know, like, you know, is there an agenda, is there a big issue here, you know, like, and, and I, you know, and I'm always, I'm always kind of reluctant to kind of go down these routes and kind of say this, you know, because, you know, as a social scientist, you know, I want to, I want a kind of social phenomena, I want to be able to understand it in terms of kind of ideology and, and social phenomena and social issues and kind of these sort of theories, yeah. Do you think it's to justify and desensitize the community as a whole? you know, to what's going on around the world and, you know, try and keep them encompassed in this? Yeah, I, I mean, in, in, increasingly, I, I think that the global, the, the kind of global context and the kind of international uh, sort of dimension is increasingly becoming important, you know. I, I, I think that, you know, if, if you look back to something, say, for example, I mean, yeah, sorry, I'm, see, I'm thinking in my head like now, and see, it's all kind of falling into place now. I'm kind of getting, yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, because for me, the, the, I, I, I think that there's been a kind of an, antipathy between the West or Christendom, you know, if we go back in full history, you know, Christendom and the Muslim world, or the Islamic world, you know, and then we've got Europe and, and, the, and the Islamic world. And, you know, see, so we, we've got this kind of, you know, we've got these kind of historical kind of like sort of uh, seedbed or something. But, but I talk about Islamophobia as being a contemporary phenomenon, and, and for me, it kind of, I think that it began in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution. And I think that the Iranian Revolution was such a huge uh, kind of juncture in terms of the kind of global politics and international politics, that actually it was so, it was like this kind of idea, it was kind of a message that kind of come in via the 24-hour news services that were kind of, you know, beginning to emerge at that time. And this kind of message into the kind of West and into the, into the United States particularly was, where has this revival of Islam kind of come from? You know, it's like, I, I, you know I, I, never, I don't think that the kind of colonialism tried to kill off Islam, but I think that they, the, the kind of colonialists thought that actually it would just peter out. You know, it would be like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put democracy in there, you know, and once they see how great our democracy is that we impose it, you know, um, that they will change their ways and, you know, like, eventually this, this religion will dissipate and, you know, it will just like to... So this kind of revival, you know, this kind of huge on the kind of global, you know, kind of political scene, the revival Islam sent out huge shockwaves. Now, I think in Britain, this kind of come together in 1989 because you then got Ayatollah Khomeini sending a fatwa against Salman Rushdie. And I'm, I'm looking around the audience and... and you're all very young, you know. I realise you're probably understood. Yeah. I, well, I remember before this, you see. Like, so you know. <laughs> so in the seventies, you know, no one spoke about Muslims. You know, you were white, black, or Asian. That's where you were. You know, the you know, Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims. Or what? You were Asian. You know, like, there was no, there was no differentiation. You know, it's like Asians. You know, that's it. Um, but then what you saw was that suddenly you had this emergence of Muslims. And I honestly remember people in, in 89 going, when did we get Muslims in this country? You know, when, when, when did Muslims turn up? You know, like, it was like, I thought they were Asians. You know, like, and so this, this, this kind of, you know, it become a real issue. Now what you have is that suddenly as well, you've got this kind of pariah figure of Ayatollah Khomeini over there in those lands where, they, you know, in the past, we could kind of keep them out suddenly bringing about a huge reaction here. And so Islam was kind of like, you know, it's kind of the proximity and its influence was, was shown. And really for me, that was where this kind of contemporary phenomenon started. And, and I think that ever since then, the kind of global and the national and the international and the local have become so blurred that increasingly they get closer and closer together. And I think that that, that, that for me, this is where, where it comes from. So, so I can't, I'm reluctant to answer that, your question in a kind of direct way, but, but there is definitely something there for me, but it does feel as though I'm going into conspiracy <laughs> territory. So, 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 so I, I apologise for not, not giving you the, the so you it. Um, in, in terms of individuals, I mean, this is, this is really one of the most difficult questions I, I'm asked. And, 
I, for 15 years, I've, I've really struggled to come up with a really good answer. Um, I, I mean, I, I just, I just think that you know, like at, at that very individual just, level, yes, certainly, yeah, yeah, at that very individual level, is just be, just be human, you know, and and try and get across that, that Muslims are human, you know. And one of the things that we I, I, we did some research last year with Muslim women who were victims of um, of street level hate crime, and one of the things we did with that was we the report we we submitted to government, we did it we didn't give policy recommendations, we, we didn't give this kind of nice kind of policy language. We told Muslim women stories using their own voices. And it was really impacting because actually at the launch <coughs> And you know, everyone who was there was actually really struck by, by people's experiences because you never hear Muslim, Muslim women's voices. You never, you never hear them, you know, sort of talking about normal things. And, and these were women who had some kind of undergone sort of abuse or, or threat or been violently attacked. One had been run over when she was seven months pregnant. And just that story of actually passing that on to people is very, very impacting. So, so there's a human element. So in terms of individuals, you know, a human element, you know, in terms of you know, sort of as, as individuals, we can we can take to task people that start talking about people, any type of people, in inhumane ways. You know, if anyone's being dehumanised or you know, sort of you know, sort of you know, their, their kind of humanity is being undermined, at that individual level, we can do that. I think in terms of sort of tackling Islamophobia more widely, I, I think it's about coming together. You know, I think it's about actually sort of you know, Muslims, non-Muslims, organisations, individuals, you know, actually standing up and sort of being honest and being open, but also, you know, having these debates, you know, I, I really, you know, I, I, I get inspired when I find that there, there's non-Muslims like coming along to these events and being engaged, because actually, I think that the, actually the Muslims here, are, you know, that are in the university, are actually doing a very good job, because, you know, if you're bringing people along who are, you know, to get them interested, that is a really first step, you know, because sometimes it's about these very small steps, you know. And this goes back to that point about sharing food, you know. Actually, someone coming into a food bank that's in a mosque, actually, it's a very small step, but it has a, you know, it can move on and not go on and so on. And I think that really what we need to do as well is, is find kind of new ways in which we can kind of respond and take government to task, because the politicians are let off the hook. The politicians are not held to account. Now, I, I still don't know the best way that we do that. But that is one of the ways that we need to actually hold the politicians to account. We need to actually sort of be intelligent, we need to think about this, and we need to work together across these divides. And I still don't know the exact way we do that. I mean, just one of the ideas that I had in my mind, I mean, we heard, for example, Baroness Warsi talking about the Muslim vote. It's interesting she's bringing out this particular concept. Um, and, and I don't know if, 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 if politicians, especially in, in Muslim, in heavily populated Muslim areas, to go and reach out to the Muslim community and do hustings and things, for example. And perhaps this is something that we uh, need to hold our politicians to account to. You know, so if you know when they are campaigning in our localities, to actually say, well, look, this is something that we find to you know it's, it's an important issue for us as Muslims living in Britain. What are you going to do to take it very to take it seriously? I mean, I, I asked this question to Ken Clark. Uh, I'm amazing. He's, he's my uh, yeah, he's my MP in my constituency. <coughs> Uh, and he, the answer he gave me was very interesting because as uh, we, we had an incident in Nottingham where uh, some members of the EDL put a pig's head on a proposed site for a mosque, and um, uh, it's the first he actually heard of it, which, which is which is interesting. Uh, so he made a note of it, and then he said to he, he said to me that um, he started talking about Europe and how there had been this rise of the of the right in Europe and how he he didn't foresee that happening here in Britain because the political culture in Britain. It's very different to that in Europe, and you, you, you see that to be the case. Uh, and I think I think this is about two, three years ago. I, I kind of I, I bought that that, yeah. that that point then. But now with the rise of UKIP and UKIP having these allegiances with all these nefarious groups in Europe, it, it kind of makes me a bit more uh, uh, you know a bit more nervous about that particular point. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I I always thought that in Britain we wouldn't have that lurch to the right, and yet increasingly we seem to be lurching quicker. Than, than most yeah. other European countries, which is really worrying. And I mean, especially when you've got groups like Brit First offering security services to UKIP speakers. You know, you know <laughs> th th that's the kind of you know, that, you know, you kind of think, wow, this is this is really we're really in a weird kind of strange place. You know, and you've got you know you've got Labour and you've got Conservatives trying to all out UKIP. UKIP. It's, 
So this is really important work. I mean, I, I think that, you know, see, I, I guess as an academic, you know, um, it's, it's all about the evidence, you know, and when people are presented with, with evidence, it, you know, I, I, I still hold on to this thing that, you know, I, I get really annoyed about the reappropriation of British values. Like, you know, so when I think about British values, it, it's about tolerance, it's about fairness, it's about the underdog, it's about treating people okay, you know, it's about all those things, and, and doing all of that in a very subtle way. You know, it's not about us boasting about how much, you know, how we get on and everything. It just happens, you know. It's very kind of normal, everyday, you know, sort of convivial sort of stuff, you know. And uh, 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 Paul Gilroy describes it as, you know, saying it's bland and mundane, you know. Britishness is bland and mundane, you know. And I do think it is that. And I think that actually, if we, you know, I, mean, I still hold on to this thing about evidence, you know, and constantly putting this evidence forward, you know, working on this and trying to. I do think that actually we will actually tackle this. And I get so upset when I see politicians on the left or in the centre of the left, even the left of the centre, actually talking about these issues and lurching to the right. And actually, you know, I think that people are only going to the right because it's, all, it's the only voices we hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really, really problematic, you know. And I think that, you know, it's also about looking at where we as people who are kind of passionate about tackling this homophobia. Where can we make these allegiances? Where can we make these alliances? You know, why are we not talking to the anti-racism movement? Why are we not talking to you know groups like Stonewall? And I know that's controversial. You know, I know it's controversial, and a lot of Muslims will be uncomfortable with that. But actually, it's about making those alliances because these have a wealth of experience and how to tackle these issues. And you know, these are these are groups which are open to discussion. You know, so we should be working there. We should be looking at these intersections where we can find partners, where we can find collaborators. But also as well, you know, like not just talking about these issues. You know, I, I always say that I know, I know when we're, I know when we've tackled Islamophobia, when there'll be a Muslim woman wearing a hijab during the weather, and no one notices that she's Muslim, and no one notices that she's wearing a hijab anymore, and it just becomes normal. And that is that is something that where we get to, you know, when when it's not, oh, this is the Muslim weather, and this is the British weather. You know, like, you know that, that's you know, so you know, that's when we've we've made it. And I, and I do think as well that, that there, there is a trick that's missed, you know, a lot of Muslim organisations will, will only, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll only kind of lobby on Muslim issues. Yeah. And actually in something like education, if you look at something like education, you know, if you look at sort of, you know, certain Muslim communities, you know, the level of education achievement is so low. But that's actually the same as in white working class communities and young black guys as well. So, you know, looking across, you can find really good partners and allies in tackling right. some of these issues, you know, like, and I think that, you know, it's like, it, it, there's, there's a kind of, there's the vertical and the horizontal, and it's about finding partners to tackle these things, and, you know. Okay, so we had some, a few more questions, didn't we? Yes, yeah, you can go first. Yeah. Differentials between East and West. 
And I was wondering if you had anything to say about Turkey, which seems to exist in between. Uh, it's an increasingly popular tourist destination for Britons, and indeed it's a debate, in the summer, so. <laughs> <laughs> a debate about its ascension to the EU, whether it happens or not, does not seem to be... Uh, the debates don't seem to include Islamophobia. In fact, it seems to be focused more on the economic consequences for the rest of Europe and its human rights than record. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Um, I agree with you when you said that the media probably is very one-dimensional image of the but my question is, in your opinion, what makes that um, image so appealing to the general public? Why do they feed on that? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so, so the surveillance issue. Um, this, this, it's a really pertinent question because when you said surveillance, I was, my next question, I was going to ask everyone if they knew what Project Champion was. Um, has anybody heard of Project Champion? <coughs> one. Thanks. One or two. So Project Champion was, was this thing you talked about in Birmingham. And um, uh, myself and my colleague at the University of Birmingham, who's a geographer, he's a human geographer, we did, um, we did some research into this. Because for those who don't know, so uh, a few years ago, basically what happened was overnight, 270 cameras, surveillance cameras, um, CCTV and uh, AMPR, so all that number, number plate recognition uh, cameras were put up. So 270 cameras were parked around two areas in Birmingham. And some were uh, over and some were covert. So nobody, even to this day, nobody knew where those covert cameras <coughs> were. So you know, that we couldn't be told. And these cameras were something on massive poles or sort of lampposts. And the cameras were even pointed into, into people's houses in, in some spaces. And what was interesting was that um, uh, is that the people in those areas, the, the communities who lived in those areas, kind of ignored them, kind of went, okay, fair enough, the cameras are. How this come to public attention was that there was, um, I, 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 don't, I won't say his name, but if you read, if you read mine and Arshad Isikji's um, article on Project Champion, you'll see you, his name in there. Um, because I, I, don't know, I don't know if you want to be on. Uh, <coughs> Uh, but he was, um, uh, so he was a white middle class uh, guy who used to work for the local council and he got up one morning and he saw this massive camera at the end of his road and he was like, where does that come from? He was asking his neighbours and everyone was like, oh, I, don't know, I don't know where that comes from and he, he went to the police and he said to the police, oh, where's that camera come from? And they went, oh don't worry sir, it's not watching you, it's watching that area. He said, nothing for you to worry about. And he went, oh, 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 it is something for me to worry about. So he said, they said, oh no, we're just watching people coming in and out of that area. And so this kind of, he then went to the Guardian. And he went, he, you know, he, he raised this issue. It was raised locally in Birmingham. It wouldn't go into the media. Somehow it didn't make the media. 270 cameras. There was a, there was a huge uprising in Birmingham in terms of communities. Um, there was consultation events. The police said, um, this is it's around the two highest density crime areas in Birmingham. So the, the, the two areas, it's all about crime monitoring, and it's about the areas where there's most amount of crime. Uh, having, having a good friend and colleague who's a human geographer, he can map this stuff. Um, yeah. So he mapped the uh, crime areas, and he mapped the uh, cameras. And interestingly, the crime areas and the cameras didn't coincide. He then mapped the most densely populated Muslim areas <laughs> with the cameras, and lo and behold, the cameras are around the two most densely populated Muslim areas. Now, this was something that went up overnight. This was something that there, there was nothing, you know, sort of there. Thames Valley Police were then called in because there was this whole kind of kind of issue around it. Was there consultation and so on? Thames Valley Police came in to do the kind of independent investigation. Now, all of us were kind of there. Oh no. But actually, the Thames Valley Police said that actually the way this had been done was wrong. It was funded by a kind of uh, ACPO TAM, which is the Association of uh, Chief Police Officers, Terrorism, and something or other funded. So all the money was for, for around counter-terrorism. And it was purely set up around two Muslim areas. So everyone who went into the area and everyone who went out was monitored. Every car that went in, every car that came out was monitored. 
Still to this day, so much of this has been redacted, so we don't know what they were going to do with the information, we don't know what, where that information was being kept, how it was being monitored, or so on. But eventually the cameras were taken down. Now, that's, good, that's all well and good. The, code, the overt ones that we saw, we know where they were, we could see they were taken down. How do we know that the covert ones were taken down? Because nobody knows where they were, and we're not allowed to know. So even though they've been taken down, we're still not told where they were. Now the problem you have is, that, and this is the thing for us, was that if you're if you work if you're in a kind of business environment, or if you work in a kind of you know corporate environment, a project champion is someone who takes something and makes it a success. So if this had been a success in Birmingham. We have no doubt that this would have been rolled out to other areas across the country as well. This was a project champion. This was the one. If this is a success, we can do this elsewhere as well. And I think that Birmingham, it's like kind of, it's like, you know, central government has a bit of a thing with Birmingham. You know, it, you know, there's not a great relationship. And it's like, well, we can do this in Birmingham. We can get away with this. But unfortunately, they didn't. So the issue of surveillance is a real, real huge issue. You know, and a really problematic one because something like that actually can go unnoticed. And when those cameras came down, the general view amongst non-Muslims in the city of Birmingham was there's no smoke without fire. So it comes back to that point we were talking about earlier. They wouldn't have put all those cameras up if there wasn't something going on. And so it's, it's self-perpetuating. And when we've had every incident we've had now in Birmingham, Local MPs, including Carly Mahmood, have said, this is why we need these cameras. Carly Mahmood called for the cameras with Trojan horse as well. I don't know what the cameras were going to do. Who's taking their kids to school? You know, so. But these sort of issues, you know, so surveillance is, is, is a huge issue. In, ter in, terms of, in terms of our rights, and this kind of picks up on this issue, it's interesting because the first piece of legislation that the new Labour government brought in was the Human Rights Act in 1998. And under the Human Rights Act, we have the right to privacy. You know. It's interesting that the government are, are now, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely shocked and appalled that we live in a Western democracy where, you know, the government is talking about revoking the Human Rights yeah. Act. I, I really think that well, that is a terrible development in terms of our political, you know, our, our politics in this country. By getting, getting rid of the rights, you know, by getting rid of the Human Rights Act, it gets rid of your right to privacy. And you have no recourse to law. So this, this interrogation of your rights actually is going to, they're going to be more and more eroded. Your privacy will become more and more eroded. And I think that what the, what the worry is here, and this issue around Facebook, is that the climate is such that actually people feel that they can, you know, scrutinize anything. Any aspect of you is open to scrutiny. Because terrorism, because you know, radicalism, because extremism is such a big issue, and because all Muslims have the capability of becoming it, we have the right to look at anything, and, and it's a really <coughs> worrying development. But and my pessimism comes out here, and I think it will get worse. Um, in fact, in, in, in terms of uh, sort of Turkey, and, and you mentioned human rights, and I think that's a really interesting. You know, kind of, kind of linking up. It, it's interesting that uh, Turkey's human rights um, uh, kind of record, which is good, you know, um, it is is focused on so highly when a lot of the former Soviet countries have equally bad human rights uh, records. But that seems to, doesn't seem to be necessarily a problem. Um, I, I think we've, we've, with Turkey's accession to the EU, it, it's a very interesting one because I think that because Turkey also is a member of NATO, so it's a very interesting one. Is that there is a real strategic value of keeping Turkey on side, but it's also a kind of side of it as well. It's like, well, you know, if we go into Europe, it's all these Muslims coming over, you know, like, and you know, <laughs> you know I, I mean, I remember Bosnia. You know, and again, you know, I don't think many people realised there was Muslims in Europe. It was like, when, when were these Muslim countries? You know, these were these were Soviet countries. <coughs> Who knew there was Muslims in these countries? You know, and there's, so I think that there is. I think again, there is this kind of this kind of fear, the fear of the of the unknown. And, and it was interesting. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head. So you know, so I just, uh, but I remember a few years ago when the, when the, when the EU was trying to write a constitution or or a new kind of. Uh, so something around kind of the, the kind of constitution of Europe, and I remember the Pope, you know, really pushing that it stated that Europe was of a Christian heritage, and I think that that this is very, you know, I think that this kind of historical legacy is very strong in terms of this. 
So I think Turkey is a very interesting one because it is this kind of place where strategically it's good to have it on the side, but also we don't want to open the floodgates. You know? it, it's, it's, it's an ally that will keep at arm's length. And the, the, the Romanians are bad enough. <laughs> well, my, my, my wife uh, has recently been to Romania and uh, she sent me loads of images back saying it's not like how the BBC News presents it, you know, they're not all riding uh, donkeys and they're not all toothless, you know, so it was, it was very interesting in terms of that. Um, and then finally, the, the, the kind of image, uh, the, the image, um, I, I think that there's, uh, I, I, there's a friend of mine, um, Mohammed Sadiq said, he's at the University of Chester, and, and he's written a lot about the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, the West's kind of uh, fetish of the Muslim world, and the, again, this kind of historical legacy, you know, like sort of you know the kind of post-Reformation, the kind of you know, if you look at the kind of yeah, you know, Orientalism, the, the kind of you know the art that kind of come out of this, the kind of fascination with you know sort of look how exotic and luxurious and you know like sort of you know wonderful this is, you know, and now. It's kind of still there. I, I think it's there. There is a kind of still a fetish, particularly with the Muslim woman, you know. And, and it's interesting because I think the Muslim woman presents a kind of challenge, but also a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of. I don't, I don't know. So it, it's kind of it, it, it's interesting for the West because, it, on one hand, it presents a kind of antithesis to the kind of the Western woman, but also there's a sense of intrigue with it as well. So that there is this, and I think that this is kind of sustaining legacy, you know, and and it's and it's really interesting, you know, going back to kind of these kind of smokescreen kind of issues. Um, if anybody's ever looked on the EDL's website for their women's division, um, which is interestingly called the Angels, EDL Angels, you know, it's a, it's not patronising at all. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, um, if you actually read it, their statement is almost like a feminist manifesto. You know, so it's again, it's interesting the way in which these lines are blurred. You know, sort of you know, almost this idea we need to protect Muslim women from Muslim men. You know, and this goes right back to colonialism. You know, the white man needs to protect a brown woman from the brown man. You know, like yeah, you know, because you know they're a threat. We also need to protect the white woman from the brown man as well because they really are a threat. You know, so and, and, and a lot of this kind of you know colonial kind of legacy, kind of Orient and Orientalism. You know, all these kind of things are still kind of there. But I also think that in, in the contemporary setting, there's much more of an immediacy with it. You know, so, and that, that works very well in that kind of white noise. They, they become very quick triggers. Okay. Um, I think that's all we have uh, time for today. Uh, so Chris, uh, thank you very much for, for, your, for your insight. Thanks very uh, so much. And uh, uh, look forward to hearing from you. for coming everyone as like you know we've seen a lot of new faces um, today we've actually set up a, a registration table if you guys want to register with the Islam Society please feel free to and um, just go ahead and we'll have two people over there to um, sign you up um, in addition to that we've got Quran coming up and um, that's going to be taking place between the 8th to the 14th um, now we've got a lot of events actually taking place we're gonna have Quran um, Quran student-led Quran recitations um, another thing is the tweed workshops um, alum We've got the alumni dinner, which is coming up as well, and the uh, gazebos um, are going to be present in the union, and you know we're just going to be present on the union as in the Islam Society. We need volunteers for that, so there's a volunteering spreadsheet as well. Um, yeah, um, another thing is, as you can see, I'm sure you all spotted uh, the food we're so, uh, going to at the end. Um, the Palestine Society has generously just donated um, a load of food to us. Um, please help yourselves to that, but. Uh, Right now, you know, as you know, what's going on in Palestine, it's heartbreaking, and we need to try and do as much as we can. So we have actually um, a bucket over here with Ahmed. So if you guys can, please donate as much as you can, then uh, it would be absolutely great. Um, so last week, they had their Right of Education Week, and uh, in the coming weeks, they're going to have their um, Palestine Apartheid Week. So uh, please do get involved with that. Um, once again, thank you so much, Zemi and Chris, uh, for absolutely everything. You know, um, do you want to come back? No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Right. Thank you very much. Um, please, yeah, upstairs. <laughs> Sorry, just, just one more thing. If anybody wants any any of the things in terms of research that I've, I've mentioned or you, you want them to talk to me about, 
do feel free to get in touch. I, I, I'm not professional enough to carry business cards. Um, but the EDR and Brit first find me very easily online. Um, so so I, it, you know, if you point Chris Allen and Islamophobia, all, all my contact is come on. But if you want anything on the sort of Project Champion or you want to look at any of the evidence I've given to government, by all means get in touch and I can, I can forward that on to you. Thanks so much.